Thanks, Mike, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me a chance to share with you some thoughts before the panel comes up. I'm here for two reasons. The first is because I heard about the event and that Michael was organizing it, and I thought I'd love to be part of that and share some thoughts. The second reason I'm going to conceal from you for a few more minutes, and then I will share it with you. Um, I want to say a few words about what I believe is one of the rarest uh, elements in human existence, and that is humility, because I think it ties directly to the importance of developing a culture in an institution where whistleblowers, people who have concerns of all kinds, feel free to raise their hands and to speak. The challenge of human existence is it's very, very hard for us to be wrong. I know this in a variety of ways. I know it from being married to an awesome person for 29 years <laughs> and discovering that as good-hearted as I am, I am frequently wrong, and it's a painful thing to be wrong. It's hard to be wrong. It's hard to stare at facts that are different than those I believe to be true and recognize that I'm in error. The human brain has evolved to embrace this difficulty with being wrong. One of the strongest forces in nature is the confirmation bias. That is, the evolved capability in our brain to suppress, to not consciously perceive facts that are inconsistent with that which we already believe. As a human being, which I am, and as a leader, which I am, this terrifies me. Because I have to begin and end each day with the recognition that I may not even perceive in my consciousness facts that are different from what I already believe that instead I will drink in, suck in facts that support my preconceptions and my biases. That terrifies me as a spouse, it terrifies me as a friend, it terrifies me as a leader. And then add to that the challenge of human existence, which is that I'm trapped in me. I can only perceive the world through an awkward six foot eight inch white, 55 year old male from the New York metropolitan area who has grown up a certain way, who has learned certain things, who has experienced certain things. The entire world comes at me through the filter that is me. And so you combine that, that really fundamental fact of our existence with the confirmation bias and the closely related challenge human beings have with being wrong, and you have a recipe for disaster if you're not careful. Inside the FBI, we are spending a lot of time talking about the importance of humility that is recognizing the things I just laid out for you, and the tendency of all of us to miss, in fact, not perceive things that are different from what we hold. And even when we're able to perceive something that's different from what we already believe, the struggle we have in being wrong, and the importance if we're to be great leaders, great partners, and a great institution, to embrace the idea that humility is a goal we may never achieve, but it's one we have to think about every single day. When we talk about leadership in the FBI, we have explained to the organization, we're looking for leaders who are confident and humble. It seems like an odd combination. But the reason it's so important is the best leaders are people who are comfortable enough in their own skin to shut up and listen. That requires confidence because insecure people struggle to listen for reasons that make sense. Real listening is a confession of weakness. Real listening is me as the listener telegraphing to you with my shoulders and my facial expressions and maybe what I do with my hands and maybe sounds I make that I need to know what you know. Right? Every single gesture, every single posture I take that encourages you to speak to me is an admission that I need to know what you know. It's a confession of weakness. It's very, very dangerous and hard for people who don't have enough confidence to be humble. It's the second reason it matters a lot to us at the FBI. Insecure people struggle to develop their own folks. Insecure people can't be sitting over there watching one of their folks shine. Insecure people have to be here because sitting over there with one of their people here is a threat to them. And so we're talking an awful lot about the importance of finding confidence that breeds humility and an awareness that I may not know enough and I need to find out more things. So why am I telling you this in the context of Whistleblower Appreciation Day? And I know it was Saturday, but it was not a shopping day on Saturday, so we got you this today. Um, is that, as Michael said, at the heart of what whistleblowing is are people who see things they think are wrong and want to talk to somebody about it. They want to be heard 
and share a concern. Now, they may be wrong, they may be right, but they believe they've seen something that's important to an institution and they want someone to listen to them. If they face an organization that is led by people who struggle, as all humans do, and have not sufficiently made progress against the lack of humility in humanity, and they face an institution that is shaped by having leaders like that, they will not find people to listen to them. They will not be heard. So what should leaders do to try and develop a culture that helps resist that lack of humility in humanity? Two things. Talk about it constantly and then do things. First thing, talk about it. It's very, very important that we do things like the Inspector General's office is helping us do, and that is teach our people. Show them the importance of whistleblowing. Show them the regulations. Show them the laws, the rules that forbid retaliation. Show them all the structure that is designed to encourage people to raise their hand. That's very, very important. It's very, very important also that the leader, in this case the director of the FBI, speak to new employees, as I do, and say, let me tell you something about the FBI. You're not entitled to be right, right? I'm not entitled to be right. You're entitled to be heard. You're entitled to an adult conversation where when you have a question, you have a concern, you have a worry, an adult looks at you, listens to you, and then engages you. Now, you have to have your mind open to the fact you may be misperceiving, you may be seeing things without context. All that's fine. You're not entitled to be right. You're entitled to be heard. So it's very, very important that the director say that explicitly. But more than these explicit lessons, I actually think the second thing a leader has to do is actually the second secret reason I'm here today. The leader has to act in a certain way so that people see that and are shaped by it and copy it. I think about how you became who you are today. I'm sure you had your share of explicit lessons. I had an awesome dad who, thank goodness, is still around. He's 86. And my dad was a bit of a speech giver. And he always seemed to have his, his thoughts organized in bullet points. And he would frequently send them to me when I was in college on a little notepad that said, these are the four things you need to do to straighten yourself out. It'd be one, two, three, four. I love my dad uh, incredibly. I can't remember any of those bullet points. Um, I'm sure I was shaped by those. But more than that, I and you were shaped by not the explicit lessons, but watching. My favorite definition of culture is the way things are really done around here, no matter what they tell you in training. Right? I think that's how we became the adults we are today. People said certain things to us. They trained us in certain ways. But we also just watched. And my favorite example are things I can't even remember, but I'm sure happened to me. I'm sure there was a day in Yonkers, New York, when I was with my mom at a shop right. That's where she used to shop. And I'm sure there was a day she got too much change from the cashier. I don't remember this, but I'm sure that I saw it and I was shaped by it. I'm sure there was a day <clears throat> we lived in a neighborhood with houses very, very close together. And so it was easy for people to sell door to door, especially in the late 60s. There'd be a lot of people come around selling stuff. I'm sure there was a day I stood behind my dad when he opened the door and somebody of a different race, a different background was at the door to sell us something. I don't remember it, but I'm sure I stood there whether I was four or eight and I saw whatever that encounter was, and I was shaped by it. And then thousands of those added up to me. Uh, my favorite example for my kids, which makes them groan, so please don't groan, is do you know, kids, that the same driving laws apply in Richmond, Virginia, and New York? The same laws. We've lived in both places as a family. To drive there, you would not know that. In, <laughs> in Richmond, Virginia, people sit at traffic lights. It's an awesome community. And when an old lady in front of you doesn't notice that the light turns green, you wait. You wait. There'll be another green light. She'll see a light eventually, and we'll be okay. Um, <clears throat> in the New York area, in contrast, uh, I had to instruct a too strong a word, urge my wife, who had never lived in New York before, when we first lived there, that if she's on the road in New York, and it's a multi-lane road, and she's in one lane and wants to move to the left lane, and there's a space between cars, do not use your signal because it's a sign of weakness. <laughs> People will notice that, and you're trying to take something from them, and that doesn't happen in New York, so they'll pull up. I actually urged her not even to turn her head to look at the mirror because they'll see that. Just with your eyes, look in the side view mirror, and then make your turn. So how is that possible? The same driving laws apply. Kids go through the same driver training. 
They have behind the wheel, they have in classroom, they get the same training and the driving is totally different. It's because of the way culture is. It's the way they really do things around here no matter what they tell you in training. They went through that same driver education course. They took the same behind the wheel from well-meaning instructors who talked about the use of signals to change lanes and the use of honks only to avoid accidents, not as a punitive measure. <laughs> and instead of that training, they watched, and they saw brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and parents drive in a certain way. And without even knowing it, they became New York drivers or they became Richmond drivers. Very, very different. And so as a leader... You have to constantly worry about that, especially when it comes to the culture that we're touching on here today. And so it's important you say the right things, that you and Michael Horowitz talk about things the right way, that you do videos together, you do training together. But more than that, it's important that you provide opportunities for people to watch and to see you. So that's the second reason I'm here today. I want my organization to know that I came because they will talk about that. And even without me having to explain the meaning of it, they will derive meaning from it. There was a fellow who just retired from the FBI named Michael Kobus, who 10 years ago worked in the New York field office of the FBI. And he noticed working there that his supervisor was giving people time off on their birthdays, but only people that the supervisor was close to. And that meant to cover their work, the FBI was paying overtime to other employees. And being a taxpayer and someone who cares about the taxpayer's money, that bugged him. And so he reported it. And the next thing that happened to Michael Kobus was he ended up on an empty floor at the FBI facility, the only human being among 130 desks sitting by himself for an extended period of time. And there were other things that were hap happened. But a message was sent to Michael Kobus. How dare you ask? How dare you Demand an answer. Now, maybe you're missing something, but how dare you insist upon that conversation? It took Michael Kobus many, many years to not only get his, his complaint sustained, but to get his retaliation complaint sustained and to get himself compensated. Why do I tell you this story? Shortly after I became director, I had the opportunity to sit down with Mr. Kobus privately in my office because I wanted to hear his story so I could learn from it. But I also wanted people to know that I had invited Michael Kobus in for a private meeting with the director because it sends a message. At the end of the director's awards that we have every year at Constitution Hall, which is a huge day in the life of the FBI, we give out an award to recognize someone who has acted with integrity, who has seen something that doesn't seem right, and they've raised their hand and said something. And I give that one personally. And what I say, frankly, doesn't matter. But the fact that I stand there and it's the award I give out personally, and it's at the very end, then I make a big show of going over and make sure I greet that person and their family incredibly warmly in front of an enormous portion of our workforce is about signaling. It's about shaping a culture. So the FBI is an imperfect organization because it's made up of imperfect human beings, one of whom is standing in front of you. We must understand that the path to getting better is humility. The model I use for my organization is LeBron James. And I'm not a front runner. I'm not saying this because the Cavs won the championship this year. I actually said this uh, when he was with the Miami Heat as well. LeBron James is my example for the FBI because LeBron James is the greatest basketball player on the earth today. And yet he believes he's not good enough, which is remarkable because he's better than all the others. But every offseason, he finds some part of his game. He watches film over and over again and then works on that part to make himself better. And so my message for the FBI is you are like LeBron James, or you ought to be. You are truly great. There really isn't anybody I believe compares to the FBI, but you are not good enough. You must constantly find ways to get better. You must adopt an attitude of humility, enough confidence to be humble, so that we create a culture in which people will embrace mistakes, will realize that when we do something wrong, it's okay. And actually, the director and the senior leadership will praise people who find mistakes and then fix them. And I'll give you one other example that was very important for our organization. We made a mistake in processing the gun background check of a guy named Dylan Roof, who then used that gun to slaughter innocent people at the AME Emanuel Church in Charleston just about a year ago. I thought it was very, very important that as a leader of the FBI, 
Once we figured out we made a mistake, we just say so. We tell people we're sorry, we made a terrible mistake, we'll work to be better. That was important, obviously, because of the case itself and the pain involved in that case. But to me, it was also an important opportunity, to, again, to signal to our culture that it's okay to be wrong, right? Be sorry, be unbelievably heartbroken as we were in that case, but embrace being wrong and then find ways to get better. That is the path to greatness. You'll never actually get to true excellence, but you will get closer and closer with an attitude of humility. So that is the way I hope to by my explicit lessons and by the places I go and the things I say and the way I stand to embrace a culture where people will speak up and will be heard. Because by doing that, we will get even better. So I thank you for allowing me to share your thoughts and enjoy your day. Thank you. Wednesday, June 9, 2021 at about 4.30 a.m. This is the Stan J. Cater Bone Accountability for Torture and Other Cruel, Inhumane, or Degrading Treatment, 35, Symptoms of Torture as of Wednesday, June 9, 2021. Our government is responsible for protecting its citizens from elements that covertly harass, torment, murder, and cause victims to commit suicide through organized stalking and remote electronic torture. Yet, unbiased research indicates that certain elements of government either engage in these activities or protect those who perform them. I seek the complete dismantling of any officially sanctioned covert government torture programs, as well as organized stalking and harassment programs. These programs are partially administered using the COINTELPRO protocols of the J. Edgar Hoover FBI of the 1960s, the passage of legislation specifically outlawing the high-tech torture, and the full prosecution of any person, regardless of his rank or position, who has violated my civil rights and my most basic human rights is in tall order. A renewed call for the continuation of the church hearing of the 1970s would be appropriate. John F. Kennedy warned about the dangers of secret societies and the harm they do to democracies in a famous speech in the early 1960s. The assaults on my mind, body, person, property, intellectual property and business interests have been occurring for 35 years. S and include, but are not limited to the following victimizations. Blanketing my dwelling and surroundings with electromagnetic energy. Bombarding my body with debilitating electronic and mind manipulation weapons. Directed energy weapons causing severe pain to body and brain. Began in at least 2005 and still continuing, with complaints to freedom from covert harassment and surveillance, FFCHS in 2009, and incited in various state and federal court cases over the past several years. Attacks causing severe artificial pain most likely from directed energy devices synchronized with telepathic harassment and organized stalking and harassment have been logged and reported to law enforcement and medical professionals since 2005. Prior to 2008 the attacks were experienced and reported to medical professionals but the sources were not known. Also reported attacks of pain to a family physician, emergency room personnel and psychiatrists. Updates on these attacks have been provided to family physician Dr. Gail Sisparo of UPMC Family Practice, Lancaster. Dr. Gail Sisparo will not provide any pain medications stronger than anti-inflammatories, which is torture in itself. Chronic pain has been diagnosed for the past 15 years. A handicap placard has been issued by the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation in 2015. Vicodin has been prescribed by Dr. Sullivan, 
family physician in 2009 and 2010. That would allow an exercise regimen which would eliminate the need for the mobility scooter, cane, and would lead to being able to ride a bike. Opiate treatments were also denied at the Center for Intervention Pain and Spine on Oregon Pike, Lancaster, which was another location where mobbing and harassment took place by both staff and patients alike. Invading my thoughts via remote sensing technologies. Was sent an autonomous email in 1998 introducing the term remote viewing. Various technologies and tactics are being used to create emotional signatures that induce various emotional states, a systematic complete hacking of my mind. Synthetic telepathy began in the end of 2004 and became full-time 24-7 by December of 2005. Making me mentally hear others' voices through the microwave hearing effect using extremely low frequencies. Synthetic and slash or mental telepathy. First started to experience telepathy slash synthetic telepathy the end of 2004 with full-time 24-7 connection by December 2005. When full-time telepathy started a few males conducted interrogations lasting several hours at a time concerning a wealth of subjects including ISC and the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA. Cannot disconnect from continuous conversations at all times with one female person. The handlers know everything I know and experience in real time. During 2006 and 2007 have been telepathic with some 10 or more persons, both male and female for short durations. Can recall most conversations and subject matter with identities of who they said they were. Interrogation type harassment is still being used telepathically to harass and for some sleep deprivation. Made first complaints to DARPA, the FBI and U.S. Senator Arlen Specter in 2006-2007. Some conversations by the persons that are telepathic with me allude to some program similar to the DARPA Datalog program where they record your entire life. Everything that you try to do on a daily basis is subject matter for conversation and harassment. Interference with thought, harassment, and interrogation is used oftentimes with electromagnetic weapon attacks to the brain or body. Depriving me of sleep due to neurological intervention. Mostly experienced sleep deprivation techniques during periods of time in 2008 to 2021. Mostly with attacks of pain from directed energy weapons to back, neck, head, brain, and heart on a few occasions, and with harassment from telepathy. Sleep deprivation is countered by sleeping for periods during the day. Currently it enables some 10 to 12 hours of sleep every 24-hour cycle. Introducing poisonous gas and radiation toxins into my home. First experienced toxic gases, chloroform, in heavy doses in 2006 to 2007 and again in about 2016 to 2021. Made complaints to the Lancaster City Police Department and the Southern Regional Police. Experienced attacks that would cause dizziness at home, in automobile, and in public. Was informed it was being released through a distribution system the size of fishing line. To counter attacks used cotton in nostrils and gas mask. In 2009 experienced attacks of what is said to be sleeping gas, when attacked could not open eyes. Took pictures during some attacks. Today poisonous gases are used to choke me akin to being waterboarded in real life. To counter several exhaust fans are located on each floor, however it only reduces the frequency. Having me stalked en masse on foot and in vehicles. 
vandalizing my home and slash or car. Gang stalking or organized stalking began in 1987 and continues today. It includes strangers using gestures such as finger under eye, various forms of harassment, and public mobbing. Complaints have been filed in 1987, 1992, 1998 and 2005 to 2021. Complaints were made to various public officials and local, state, and federal agencies as mental duress. The terms organized stalking, gang stalking, targeted individual, etc., was not learned until a few years ago. The organized stalking and harassment followed in several states, some while traveling from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to California. Tracking technologies may have been used and most likely are still being used. Police were involved in most places. Dr. John Hall in his book A New Breed, Satellite Terrorism in America, devotes an entire chapter on neighbors. The Ramirez family of 1252 Fremont Street have been used extensively by Lancaster City Police and the District Attorney's Office for some five or more false arrests and imprisonments resulting in, two, jail terms of 30 days and nine months, and a current sentence of 15 years probation. Or until the age of 77 in 2017 and 2019. Tapping, bugging, my phones. Complaints of phone tapping slash tampering were made to New Jersey Bell in 1987 with a service call to Stone Harbor, New Jersey to check lines and phones. The same was done by a Bell Atlantic repairman in Conestoga, Pennsylvania in 1998. In 2004 a complaint with the report number was filed with the Pennsylvania Attorney General Office in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Agent Amy Zelnick, regarding interference with phone calls and impersonations by perps intercepting and rerouting calls. Computer hacking complaints were filed to local authorities in the County of Lancaster and the Cyber Crime Unit of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in 2005 to 2010. Again, visits to FBI offices and the U.S. Attorney's Office began in or about 2016 to 2018. In 2021 these issues are before the federal and state courts in various cases of landmark issues and evidence. Blacklisting me in the labor market. Filed complaints of employment discrimination with the Pennsylvania Attorney General in 2006 and the Lancaster County Human Relations Commission in 2008 and in 2018. In 2009 completed the LIDA work program with a certified diploma for completing all courses. Workplace Mobbing Experienced in 1987 at Financial Management Group, Ltd., American Helix of High Industries in 1991 and Flum Contractors Inc., in 1997-1998. Filed complaints and logs as mental duress and harassment. Was forced out of all three organizations as a result of the mobbing and harassment. Public mobbing. Public type mobbing and organized stalking and harassment was perpetrated heavily in the years 2005 to 2021 in the following places, the Lancaster County Courthouse, the Lancaster County Public Library, the Pennsylvania Career Link, and the Millersville University Library and University offices. I was given suspicious and illegal no trespass notices in some 18 public places in Lancaster County in the years 2005 to 2009 without just cause. I was complaining of stalking and harassing in most all of those public places. 
the Lancaster County Public Library and the Millersville University took away my access to a computer after my personal computers were vandalized and slash or hacked inoperable. Fulton Bank took away my safe deposit box. Others included my church of worship, various bars and restaurants and one attorney's office. Complaints have been filed regarding the same in courts and with various authorities. In 2021 the mobbing takes place at supermarkets, courthouses, banks and Pennsylvania State Building in Harrisburg, and federal courthouses. These occurrences are violations of the public accommodation laws, violations of the American Disabilities Act of 1990, as well as violations of discrimination. A complaint was filed against the new Marriott Hotel expansion bar called the Exchange in 2019 with the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office for violating the public accommodation laws. Attempted Murder Experienced with an attempt of vehicular homicide in 1987 and again in 1991 after national news media reported ISC slash CIANSA connection of arms to Iraq. The incident involved a vehicle changing lanes and direction and heading directly toward me in the wrong direction running me off the road, narrowly missing a tree. I filed the incident in federal courts and used as a motion to seal federal case no. 05-2288 in 2005 in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Was rear-ended in 2015 and 2018. Today. The attempts are made by gassing the home at 1250 Fremont Street with poisonous gases, and poisoning the medical marijuana. The long-term effects are unknown. This again has been extreme in 2021. Pet Killing Cat was killed in 2005 and 2006 with complaints to the Lancaster County Humane Shelter and the Southern Regional Police Department. Illegal Entries of Home Slash Properties First in 1987 in Stone Harbor, New Jersey, then again in 1991, 1997 to 1998, and most serious in 2005 to 2021. Filed police reports and insurance claims, most with the Southern Regional Police Department of Conestoga, Pennsylvania, State Farm, and Harleysville Insurance Companies. Complaints and private criminal complaints have been filed at 1250 Fremont Street since 2006 and currently in 2021 to local state, and federal authorities. All insurance claims from the vandalism and thefts at 1250 Fremont Street have been denied by several different property insurance policies. Illegal Repossessions Airplane in 1987 containing legal and business files. Home slash property and contents in 2006 also containing legal and business files and documents were stolen when the Southern Regional Police filed an illegal bail supervision violation and spent 60 days in the Lancaster County Prison until Judge Allison nullified the secured bail, which was maliciously and purposefully falsified and ordered the immediate release. However, while in prison on December 20, 2006 my home at 220 Stonehill Road Conestoga was illegally sold at sheriff sale. However, the deed was not transferred until the end of February 2007, yet the Southern Regional Police enforced a no trespass notice against me and the contents went missing until April of 2007. The following properties were illegally repossessed or extorted, 
433 West Marion Street, Lancaster, Pennsylvania 2323, New Danville Pike, Conestoga, Pennsylvania 554, Berkeley Road, Stone Harbor, New Jersey 220, Stone Hill Road, Conestoga, Pennsylvania. Attempts at 1250, Fremont Street by Lancaster City and County officials have been ongoing in 2021. Physical Assaults One attack and filed complaint with police report in Los Osos, California in 2005 and one in the city of Lancaster at the Brickyard Restaurant and Bar. Police reports were filed and obtained for both. Threats of physical violence are a daily occurrence from occupants and visitors at 1,252, 1,256, and 1,242, Fremont Street, Lancaster, Pennsylvania as well as other neighbors and passerbys in 2021. False Arrests Experienced 7 in 1987 and more than 20 in 2005 and 2006 in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Lancaster County Court of Common Pleas. The false arrests were charges that were all dismissed prior to court hearings. Others took place in 2017 to 2021 and currently there are federal habeas corpus cases in the U.S. Third Circuit Court of Appeals for the 2. Ramirez Staling charges, cases 6520 to 2017 and 0921 to 2019 in the Lancaster County Court of Common Pleas. False Imprisonments Spent 7 to 10 days in Lancaster County Prison in 1987 with all charges dismissed and again for some 60 days in 2006 with all charges dismissed. The 60 days of imprisonment of 2006 was triggered with a false report of missing a bail supervision meeting, which was confirmed to be false in court, However bail was maliciously and purposefully reinstated as secured instead of unsecured. The appropriate appeal was filed which secured my release after some 60 days of false imprisonment. There were no charges that resulted in any convictions. Spent another 30 days in 2017 and some, 9, months in 2019. Prison sentences were only experienced during Republican presidencies, 1987, Reagan, 2006, Bush, 2017, Trump, and 2019, Trump. Psychiatric abuses with false suicide allegations from perpetrators slash stalkers. One in 1987 resulting in a forced hospitalization for several hours by police in Stone Harbor, New Jersey. And one again in February of 2005 resulting in police restraining me in my home and abusing me. This one was a fraudulent and phony email sent to police by a perp. The Southern Regional Police had to vacate after the email was proven to be a fraud. The Lancaster City Police began a string of fabricated mental health warrants, all by LT. Detective Clark Baringer in 2010, 2015, and 2016. No psychiatric commitments resulted in medications after discharge, or treatments after discharge of any mental health warrants or arrests. There have been, two. Certified Forensic Psychiatric Evaluations ordered by the Lancaster County Court of Common Pleas in both 2018 and 2019 with the conclusion being the same diagnosis, delusional disorder. No bipolar or schizophrenia. Vandalism to property. First in 1987 in Stone Harbor, New Jersey, then again in 1991, 1997 to 1998 and most serious in 2005 to 2021 
filed police reports and insurance claims, most with the Southern Regional Police Department of Conestoga, Pennsylvania and Harleysville Insurance Company. 10 to 15 computers have been rendered inoperable since 2005 along with various electronics equipment, DVD recorders, printers, household items, appliances, etc., most insurance claims have been paid for 220 Stonehill Road, Conestoga, Pennsylvania up until 2006. However, all insurance claims while at the present address of 1250 Fremont Street, Lancaster, Pennsylvania have been denied. In 2018 there have been bullet or compression rifle holes found in two upstairs windows, the front porch light, and the 2004 Santa Fe while at 1250 Fremont Street, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The bullet holes in the upstairs windows, which are still present occurred on or about June 9, 2018. In the past years a wave of purchased items, online and in stores, were received broken or the wrong item and all had to be returned. Some included items to secure my property, and others included computer-related items, others were household and clothing items. Gas Lighting The illegal entering of home and causing psychological duress by moving items and or hiding items. First reported in 1998 to the Conestoga police and continued to present. Clothing was also manipulated and altered. The term gas lighting was used in a 1940s movie and is known as a SIOPS weapon which includes the moving and or hiding of objects in your home. The daily draining of my hot tub was also used as a psychological warfare tactic and used to run up utility bills at both residences in Conestoga and Lancaster. Numerous complaints were made to police in 2008 to the present date in 2021. The gas lighting has gone extreme in 2021 with occurrence happening while on different floors of the home at 1250 Fremont Street, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Thefts of Property As evidenced by various police complaints, insurance claims, and incident reports. At one point Indiana 20012 Allstate Insurance sent an attorney to the conference room of the Lancaster County Bar Association for a two-part recorded deposition regarding an insurance claim, which was also provided to me, it was recorded by a court reported hired by Allstate Insurance. Vandalism to Car Slash Truck since 2005 have experienced years of gas siphoning, battery outages, letting air out of tires, and wetting of inside of floor mats as psychological warfare tactics by perps and stalkers. Made numerous complaints the Lancaster City Police Department. Finally in January 2021 the 2004 Santa Fe was sold due to the vandalism, which was requiring multiple trips walking the battery up to the Manor Shopping Center, some six blocks away, pulling a handcart, all the while being crippled. Toxic Chemical Causing Running Nose Experienced on regular basis in 2009 when in public places. Was not in conjunction with cold-slash-flu symptoms. Research states it is a tactic used in electronic warfare technologies. The running nose is a tactic that stops you cold whatever you are doing to have to find tissues, or whatever to stop the dripping. Again, in 2021 it has been extreme, as have most all symptoms. Computer Hacking Computer hacking complaints were filed to local authorities in the county of Lancaster and the Cyber Crime Unit of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in 2005 to 2010. Numerous complaint numbers have been secured. Complaints of cell phone hacking was also reported in 2010. 
websites and blogs were regularly hacked and sometimes taken offline. Electronic calendars, court documents, and financial records were often hacked causing many problems of the years, including having to withdraw civil complaints without prejudice so as to preserve all claims. Cyber Stalking most in 2005 to 2021. Complaints to Microsoft Legal Counsel, Yahoo Message Board, and the FBI Cyber Crime Unit, as well as adding Facebook and founder Mark Zuckerberg as defendant in case no. 08-13373 in the Lancaster County Court of Common Pleas. The stalking also includes complaints against the Lancaster Free Thought Society, an atheist group that filed a complaint against the Pennsylvania legislatures for wanting equal access to address the body in the mooring for the morning prayer or invocation. In that complaint the group outed famous persons of different disciplines as having been atheist with the source of the information, with Mark Zuckerberg founder of Facebook being one. Interference slash delay slash theft of U.S. mails. First reported to U.S. Postmaster of Mail Tampering and Illegal Changing of Address in 1987. In 2008 to 2009 have made several more complaints to the U.S. Postmaster Inspector General who claimed to have begun investigations. Some caused missed court hearings and other missed appointments and or meetings. Again in 2021 the mail delivery problems have been amplified. Electromagnetic weapons causing severe muscle spasm slash cramps. First experienced in 2006 to present. One experience in 2006 was while I was in my hot tub and the pain and cramp was so severe in my left calf muscle, you automatically bent over to rub it out, which placed my head underwater, I had to crawl out of the hot tub before almost drowning. Electromagnetic weapons causing sexual stimulation. First experienced in 2005. This component of the microwave attacks have developed into a steady pace of telepathic sex with persons of all areas of life. Since I am totally isolated from the female population as far as any type of physical relationship, even a simple visit to my home at 1250 Fremont Street Lancaster, Pennsylvania has been impossible, the telepathic sex is most likely used as a means of sexual blackmail. On most occasions some five or more partners are experienced in the course of an one or two hours, including public officials. This is co-opted with being drugged and raped at 1250 Fremont Street Lancaster, Pennsylvania which is also a separate chapter in Dr. John Hall in his book A New Breed, Satellite Terrorism in America titled Rohypnol and Satellite Weapons. Forced Hospitalizations Forced Hospitalizations in 1987, 2 one for six hours and one for five days, 2006 one for three days, 2009 one for several hours while in intensive care for emergency surgery, and 2010 one for eight days, and one in 2015 and 2016. Filed complaints to Citizens Commission for Human Rights in 1991 and 2008. Manipulation and theft of documents. Numerous thefts and manipulation of all legal and business documents both in paper and in electronic format have occurred since 1987. Microfiche slash microfilming began in 1987 and other measures to secure documents have been ongoing to present. Numerous complaints have been filed with law enforcement since 1987. Again in 2021 this has been extreme, especially considering the ongoing litigation in state and federal courts. Creating an itch on the hardest to reach places on the body that makes you want to scratch to the bone. 
The itch can attack at a moment's notice, and being crippled means getting out of bed or off of the desk chair causing further aggravation and torture. Anti-itch ointments have to be constantly rotated to counter the pain and suffering. The constant prohibition of adequate medical care. Namely keeping a mobility scooter from being provided by already qualifying Medicare supplement insurance since early December 2020, which keeps me from leaving my home unless completely necessary for limited court-related appointments, which in and above itself is a form of total isolation and solitary confinement that is accompanied by harassment and stalking by neighbors. And finally the denial of the Lancaster Court of Common Pleas to allow me to carry pepper spray as a means of self-defense coupled with the ongoing stalking and harassment by anyone at any time lays out a scenario of murder by some crazed stalker as a real threat. both sides. Let there be no mistake in terms of who was the relentless driver, some might even say persistent beyond belief driver, uh, of this issue. It was Susan Collins. And once again, um, her service uh, shows that she's standing up for America's diplomats, the intel community serving in the country, serving our country around the world, who, as Senator Collins already indicated, have been involved in dangerous incidents resulting in brain trauma and other unexplained illnesses. We've called it the Havana Syndrome. The remarkable thing is that for nearly five years, we've been aware of these reports. And we've seen, as the Senator mentioned, attacks on U.S. personnel in Cuba, in China, around the world. Matter of fact, we hear these reports here in this country. And rather than disappearing or going down in number, they actually appear to be increasing. Five years after the start of this effort, we don't know what happened, we don't know who did it, and we don't know what kind of device was used. Mr. Pre Madam President, this is wrong. Particularly, I want to point out, and this is an area where we, we were, again, in bipartisan agreement. Under the last administration, we just didn't treat these victims from the intel community, State Department, DOD, with the seriousness they deserved. As chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, I know the hardships, sacrifices, and risks our intelligence officers, diplomats, and other personnel serving overseas endure, often anonymously often without recognition. The fact that some of these brave women and men have been subjected to these serious health issues by unknown attackers is unacceptable. That their own government did not believe them when they were injured or denied them proper medical attention and care is beyond the pale. These are folks who are injured while serving our government, in some cases facing lifelong health consequences. There was all of that surface, and for a while they just got blown off. It's inexcusable that they were treated this way, and it's outrageous that we still don't know who did it or what tool was used in these attacks. Their country, after this service, needs to have their backs. And with Senator Collins' legislation, now this passed the Senate, and our hope soon to pass the House, we will show that the country will have their backs. I also want to give credit to the new CIA director, uh, Ambassador Burns, for making this a top priority. On the Senate Intelligence Committee, there is complete bipartisan unanimity on this issue. We're going to ensure that the United States gets to the bottom of this, identifies those responsible for those attacks on American personnel, holds them accountable, and ensures that these attacks on American personnel stop once and for all. And let me echo what Senator Collins said. This should be one in an ever-growing list of topics that President Biden ought to raise with President Putin. We must protect our people around the globe. At the same time, it's more important than ever that the United States also provides those affected by these attacks with the medical and financial support they deserve. Again, that's why Senator Collins' legislation, the Havana Act, is so important. And let me echo again what 
Senator Collins said, my partner in this as well has been Vice Chairman Rubio and our good friend Senator Shaheen. The fact that this passed this quickly, unanimously, uh, is extraordinarily important, but it is just the first step in having the backs of our diplomats, our intel personnel, our DOD, and for that matter, anyone who has been a victim of this kind of activity. Again, I want to thank Senator Collins for her leadership on this issue. I can assure you, as Senator Collins said, and Senator Rubio and I have repeated a number of times, the Intelligence Committee of the Senate is going to get to the bottom of this. We're going to make sure, and we've taken a giant step on this by passing this legislation, that the personnel will get the medical and, if necessary, financial assistance they need, that we're going to find out who did it, we're going to find out what type of device, and then we're going to hold them accountable. Madam President, with that, I yield the floor.
Enterprise and WebTAC were involved with ISC and Chemcom. ISC is a trade show for Chemcom. ISC is London Exchange. London Exchange. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I need a thousand shares. I sold them when things started hitting it. Scud missiles, crude, inaccurate, and for the most part, ineffective. But the Iraqi military was well on its way to developing a far more powerful and accurate ballistic missile, one that was intended to carry nuclear warheads. And federal investigators tell us that some of the necessary equipment being used in that program came from the United States. If there were no license with these shipments, I am absolutely shocked to learn that that sort of activity was taking place. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Powell. Television and investigative journalism is something of an uneasy match. Television news thrives on immediacy. Thorough investigations take time. 
Television stories need pictures, video, investigations attempt to uncover events which someone has tried to conceal. It's difficult to illustrate a cover-up, but try to be patient with us. What we're going to report tonight is part of an ongoing investigative effort by ABC News Nightline and the Financial Times of London. It is only one piece of what we believe to be a much larger fabric. But let's focus on what a number of sources, both inside and outside the U.S. government, have already confirmed for us. Remember the scenes? They were shot by an ABC News camera team in Baghdad on the night of January 16th, when U.S. aircraft began their bombing campaign against the Iraqi capital. That blizzard of anti-aircraft fire was directed in part by a radar tracking system sold to the Iraqi government by a company in South Africa. The South Africans sold quite a number of militarily useful items to Iraq, including cluster bombs and fuses. Those sales were handled by a Chilean middleman. But South Africa also conveyed to Baghdad some key technology that Iraq was using in the development of its ballistic missile system. All of this, the radar tracking system, the cluster bomb technology, the ballistic missile components, were sold by South Africa to Iraq. But most of what they sold, the South Africans had purchased from a company here in the United States. Officers of the CIA knew about those sales from the United States to South Africa, knew what was going, knew how it was getting there. Even though such sales were and are against the law, the CIA did nothing to stop them. Nightline correspondent Jeff Greenfield has details of the story that was compiled by reporters from ABC News Nightline and the Financial Times. When you talk about the American heartland, you're talking about a place like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's Amish country. It's small town Main Street. It's Norman Rockwell covers of the Saturday Evening Post. Lancaster, Pennsylvania was also the home of International Signal Control, a home-growing business that was a major regional employer, and whose founder and chairman, James Garron, was a generous regional benefactor. Garron was probably the greatest philanthropist in the decade of the 80s that Lancaster has ever known. There was something unknowable about the nature of the business, but it was sort of thought to be okay that it's government stuff, it's somehow it's okay. What ISC did was to make or supply military hardware and components, everything from cluster bombs to state-of-the-art electronic gear to blueprints, so their customers could build bomb factories of their own. But it's not what ISC made or supplied that has made it the target of federal prosecutors for the last two years. It's where ISC's equipment and technology and know-how wound up and how it got there. An ABC Nightline Financial Times investigation has unraveled a startling story with three key elements. First, that highly sophisticated technology flowed from ISC to South Africa, including technology critical to long-range missile development, missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons. Second, this technology went from the United States to South Africa in clear violation of the law. Third, these shipments went on for years with the full knowledge of Central Intelligence Agency officials. What's more, federal investigators say they have good reason to believe that some of this technology, including ballistic missile technology, shipped illegally from ISC to South Africa, was in turn sold to Iraq, where it wound up as part of Saddam Hussein's military machine that the U.S. fought against in the Gulf War. If these reports are true, and uh, I take it there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that they are, uh, then we have a renegade operation on our hands uh, for whom the rule of law means nothing, uh, for which the elected representatives apparently have no control, have no ability to direct policy, have no ability to say what they can and cannot do. It all started legally, if covertly, back in 1974. That's when the National Security Agency, a super-secret U.S. intelligence unit, asked ISC to help it complete Project X a chain, a chain of electronic, electronic listing posts based at South Africa's Simonstown Naval Station. Station. South, South Africa was using these posts to follow Soviet, Soviet submarine traffic off the Cape of Good Hope. Hope. To, to ensure secrecy, ISC, ISC and the NSA made sure the shipments could not be traced back to them. They created a company called Gamma Systems Associates, 
In fact, this company was nothing more than a post office box at John F. Kennedy Airport. Gamma was a cutout. In other words, it's a straw man company, which uh, is technically not part of the government, but it's agreeable to the wishes of the government. But this sanction and covert operation stopped in 1977, when President Carter, a strong opponent of South Africa's apartheid regime, told the U.S. firm to stop any military-related business with Pretoria. But ISC continued shipping electronics, some civilians, some military, to South Africa. Then, in the early 1980s, South Africa began to intensify its efforts at ballistic missile development. For ISC, that was a golden opportunity because one of its top executives was a man named Clyde Ivey, an American electronics expert who has been called the father of South Africa's missile program. Ivey had extraordinary contacts in that nation's defense structure. Beginning in 1984, federal investigators say, senior ISC executives, including Clyde Ivey, began regular contacts with CIA officials. And, these investigators add, the CIA officials had already been following what ISC was sending to South Africa. Over the next four years, the agency learned the whole picture. Reporter Tom Flannery is part of the ABC Financial Times investigation. Well, they knew that ISC was uh, utilizing a former national security agency cutout company, Gamma Systems Associates, to ship large volumes of very expensive, highly sophisticated military equipment illegally to South Africa from 1984 through 1989. And did the CIA tell anybody at all about it? They told not a soul, neither law enforcement nor legislative. And what specifically did the CIA know that ISC was sending to South Africa? Some of the most sophisticated electronic gear imaginable. Telemetry tracking equipment used to receive signals from missiles. Gyroscopes used to guide the missiles. And photo imaging equipment called film readers used to monitor a missile's performance. This equipment is exactly what a country would need to develop, test, and perfect long-range nuclear-capable ballistic missiles, which is what South Africa was doing in the mid-1980s. I think it's inconceivable that the equipment would be used for any other purpose. This was not small-scale business. The telemetry tracking equipment alone added up to nearly 20 tons, enough to fill a healthy chunk of a 747 cargo plane. Not everything ISC shipped was so enormous, but ISC was shipping equipment to South Africa almost every week for four years, much of it through the Gamma Systems Associate cutout. Moreover, this flatly illegal business went on, leaving an elaborate paper trail, utterly unimpeded by U.S. law enforcement, right up until the end of 1988. I would be shocked, and I would feel that I had been lied to if any sort of operation were going in which the agency or any other intelligence organization was trying to abuse customs by going around it or going through it. Indeed, the laws on the books passed by the Congress couldn't have been clearer in banning the sale of American military technology to South Africa. But there's another more disturbing twist to this tale of illegal arms shipments. Once the American-made hardware went to South Africa, it didn't stop there. South Africa, after all, is a major arms industry. And, as former Ambassador Herman Nichols says, it was an industry in the mid-1980s very hungry for customers. I think the South Africans at that stage you know, were quite keen to, to sell almost anywhere. Including Iraq. For instance, ISC sold South Africa fuses for cluster bombs, one of the most effective killing machines around. South Africa took that technology and, in turn, sold hundreds of thousands of bomb fuses to Iraq, a deal brokered by Chilean arms merchant Carlos Cardoon, one of the biggest suppliers of weapons to a grateful Saddam Hussein. In other instances, American technology went directly from South Africa to Iraq. What kind of technology? Well, look again at this incredible footage from the bombing of Baghdad on January 16th. That, says one American law enforcement official, that was some of the stuff that got through to Iraq through the ISC shipments to South Africa. In this case, electronic components of a South African radar system guiding Iraq's anti-aircraft guns. Finally, federal investigators say even American missile technology made its way from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to South Africa to Iraq. Had the Gulf War not intervened, Saddam Hussein would have been well on the way to developing an operational Condor II missile, giving him 
with the critical help of American born technology, the power to deliver chemical or even nuclear weapons anywhere in the Middle East. I'm Jeff Greenfield for Nightline. We contacted the CIA this morning, gave them the broad outlines of the story you've just heard and seen, and requested a reaction. At 7.15 this evening, the agency faxed to us the following statement. The Central Intelligence Agency declines to comment on these allegations concerning the activities of the International Signal and Control Corporation. However, it is the CIA's policy to cooperate fully with the Department of Justice on matters relating to possible violations of U.S. laws. We suggest that Nightline contact the Department of Justice regarding these allegations. That statement, as you may have noticed, is silent on the allegations of CIA misconduct. But, as suggested, we contacted Justice. It was by then, of course, after business hours, but a Justice Department spokesman returned our call. His statement was even simpler than the CIA's. It is not something we would comment on, one way or the other. When we come back, we'll discuss the implications of this story. Joining us now here in our Washington bureau are Senator Arlen Specter of Pennsylvania, who served on the Senate Intelligence Committee during the years when the weapons transfer took place. Jeffrey Kemp, a member of the Reagan administration's National Security Council and author of a forthcoming book on the global arms race. Stephen Bryan, former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, whose job was to stop the transfer of weapons technology. And one of the principal reporters in this investigation, Lionel Barber of the Financial Times of London. Senator Specter, as I just noted, you were a member of the Intelligence Committee during this period. Uh, should such an operation, had it been sanctioned, have come to the attention of your committee or some other congressional committee? Uh, if, in fact, there was such an operation, and I'm answering a hypothetical question because we only have the allegation, it would be the responsibility of the CIA to tell the Intelligence Committee under applicable law. They have to give a timely notification. Would you be free to tell us if indeed such notification was made? No, I would not be free to tell you one way or the other because all of that would be secret. But I can give you this generalization uh, that in the period from December of 1986 after Iran Contra broke, uh, there was a very intense effort made by CIA uh, to be extremely careful on notification of covert activities. You and I spoke the other day, uh, and we were discussing in general terms the inclination of the Bush administration now to be responsive to this kind of thing. In other words, to make sure that the Congress is known. Uh, and, and if memory serves me correctly, you were suggesting that the, the administration really is disinclined to do that. Well, I believe that the president uh, is inclined to make no covert operations. Uh, there has been a refusal on the part of counsel to the president, and I'll be specific. Uh, Boyden Gray, the uh, lawyer who's counsel to the president, who very strenuously resisted an effort to have a statutory notification put into law. Uh, uh, the uh, officials around the president and the National Security Council, according to my understanding, and I've had it from very authoritative sources, were willing to have a statutory 48-hour notice, but Mr. Gray, Gordon Gray, the counsel of the president, was adamant in refusal on the ground that it would impinge on the president's constitutional authority. Mr. Bryan, I, I know you're somewhat skeptical just of the general notion that this kind of weapons technology would flow from the United States to South Africa. Is that correct? Well, I'm, I'm more uh, skeptical about it flowing to Iraq. Uh, I worked on the Condor case. In fact, I uh, tried to block it, and I think we mortally wounded that project, and I never heard of any technology coming out of uh, South Africa. primary source was West Germany uh, and Italy, and to a lesser extent, Argentina. But what about the notion of this kind of technology flowing from the United States to South Africa? Well, we, we tried very hard during this uh, period to interdict any technology that we knew of going to South Africa or to any other country that was blocked from receiving military technology from the United States. And uh, this is a, a story that I never heard before. Yeah, does, it, does it surprise you that weapons technology would flow, perhaps even without the knowledge of senior officials at the Defense Department? 
Uh, nothing ever surprises me nowadays, but uh, it's certainly not a story that we knew of uh, at the time that I served in the uh, Reagan administration. Dr. Kemp, uh, give us your sense of what justification, because indeed the whole notion, A, of weapons technology flowing from the United States to South Africa, and then B, as Mr. Bryan suggests, uh, that technology flowing from South Africa to Iraq, on the face of it, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, on July 3rd and 4th, 1987, in Kansas City, you met with Iranian Defense Minister Mr. Ben Benashi. Do you know anything about such a meeting? No, sir. And finally, according to Mr. Ben Benashi, on April 20th, 1989, you met with him in a private home in Parmas, New Jersey, regarding the subject of arms sales to Iraq. During the 70s and 80s, today was indicted, along with other executives who worked at International Signal and Control. News has been following this story for years. The night Susan Shapiro begins our coverage from the federal courthouse in Philadelphia. At a packed news conference, U.S. Attorney Michael Bailson detailed major indictments against James Garron and other top executives of International Signal and Control. The Lancaster defense contractor is accused of masterminding a scheme that involved illegal arms sales and a $1 billion fraud. The purpose of the financial fraud was to make phony contracts look authentic and to build up the value of ISC into something that it was not. The enormous and complex scheme, which was described as looping, was apparently enough to defraud British defense contractor Ferranti International which merged with ISC in 1987. Ronnie itself initially couldn't believe that they had been frauded until our agents explained the depth of the problem to them. Ferranti told News 8, we have been cooperating with the U.S. government and are glad to see those efforts come to fruition. Garen is charged with eight counts, including financial fraud, mail fraud, securities fraud, money laundering, and violation of arms control laws. Officials of six federal agencies who were here showed off some of the weapons they say ISC shipped illegally to South Africa and in turn ended up in Iraq during the Persian Gulf War. After the war with Iraq, proximity fuses like this were found in southern Iraq. Inside were power supplies that could be traced to ISC in Lancaster. And from a DOD standpoint, the flagrancy of this case is that ISC and its officials put greed and the ability to make a buck ahead of our fighting men. Garrett's attorney, Joseph Tate, issued a statement saying that technology is known around the world and anyone can obtain it. In addition, officials here would not comment on an allegation that the CIA had full knowledge of the armed shipments. Many government agencies, including the CIA, cooperated in this investigation, and I think I should just leave it as that. Garrett, who's made a plea agreement with the federal government, was not arrested, but other top company executives who worked closely with him 
were taken into custody in Lancaster and arraigned in Philadelphia. Parents 